Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, makers of parquet margarine and a complete line of famous quality food products, presents Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve. Kraft brings you The Great Gildersleeve every week at this time, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore, with music by Claude Swayton. We'll hear from The Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. With quality foods in such big demand, it's only natural that more and more families should want to buy parquet margarine. Parquet's quality is known from coast to coast. And parquet's delicious flavor is preferred by millions to any other brand. So that explains, in large part, why you can't always get parquet margarine these days at your favorite food store. It's simply because more and more families are buying this spread that tastes so good. Kraft wants to assure you, however, that everything possible is being done to keep dealers supplied. All available parquet margarine is distributed fairly and equitably. So if you can't get parquet the very first time, try again, won't you? The chances are that right soon your dealer will have a new supply. Look for and ask for Parquet, the nourishing spread that tastes so good. Now for the great Gildersleeve. On a fine May morning, he steps out on his veranda to survey his property and incidentally see what his new neighbor is up to across the street. He finds his nephew, Leroy, returning from reconnaissance. Leroy? Yeah? Come here a minute. What do you want? What's going on over there? What are those men doing? Oh, they're gardeners. One of them's cutting down the hedge. The hedge? What for? I don't know. Mr. Bullard just told me he wanted to cut down, that's all. He said he couldn't see. Oh, he did, did he? Why, George, if he cuts down his hedge, I'm going to let mine grow up. I'm not going to have Bullard spying on me. He's not spying on anybody, Unc. He's just trying to fix the place up. Yeah? It's going to be swell. Mr. Bullard says he's going to have those old barberry bushes ripped out and have all new planting there. Rhododendrons. He's going to fix it up swell. Oh, he is, is he? Well, as a matter of fact, I've been thinking of doing some fixing up around this place. Yes. Yeah, I know. You keep talking, but you never I do... mean it. Now, those bushes there in front of the porch. Those Barbary bushes. Never did like those. Too scraggly. You ought to dig them out. All those? Certainly. I think it would look better with something else in there. Might decide to put in some, well, some rhododendrons, maybe. Yes. Why not? That'd be great. Well, I guess I'll be going over to see... Leroy... Yeah? While you're resting, my boy. Yeah? Out in the garage to the left of the workbench, you will find a spading fork. Bring it. He. <laughs> yes, by George, we may not be millionaires here. We may not be able to afford a staff of gardeners. But that's no reason we can't have this place looking just as well as the Bullards. <laughs> You're not handling the fork right, Leroy. I'm not? No. You show me. I don't need to show you. Just do as I say. Throw your weight behind it. Why doesn't he throw his weight behind it? (laughs) Confound it, Leroy. You're not trying. I am so. Don't just peck at it. Here, give me that. Okay. No, you keep it. (laughs) Keep trying. For corn's sake. Hey, here comes Mrs. Ransom. Oh. Good morning, Throckmorton. Uh, hello, Leela. Isn't it a lovely morning? I saw you were gardening, too, so I just had to run over. Hello, Leroy. Having fun. Huh. <laughs> Say, you're looking mighty cute this morning, Leela. It's my gardening hat. I just love gardening, don't you? Love it. Keep digging, Leroy. <laughs> doing here anyway, Throckmorton? I'm digging out all these Barbary bushes. He's digging them. Mm, my, that's quite a job. You're not kidding. These things have roots. What we need is more manpower here, Leroy. Where's Bertie? You won't get her. She started spring cleaning. Well, uh, where's Marjorie then? I don't know. Up in her room, I suppose. You go up and tell her to come down. Okay. She spends entirely too much time in her room. 
Go up and tell her, Leroy. <laughs> that boy has the soul of a train announcer. <laughs> Trot, Ma, I noticed Mr. Bullard is fixing up his place over there, too. So I noticed. Well, I believe he's even got a man digging out his barberry bushes. Yeah. Well, monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> Don't you like Mr. Bullard, Rock Martin? I thought him rather charming the only time I met him. Mr. Bullard is a snob, and you may tell him I said so, Leela. Him and his DeSoto. I don't understand. Well, I won't go into details. But Judge Hooker and I tried to pay him a neighborly visit the other day when he was moving in his furniture, and the guy was too busy to speak to us. Well, of course, there's nothing worse than moving. That's all right. He needn't speak to us if he don't want to. But just wait till he wants a favor. Wait till they really move into that house, and he wants to get his water turned on. Ha! He'll darn well wait his turn. He'll be lucky if he gets water by July. He'll be lucky if he doesn't have to bring it in on donkey back. In goat skins. Oh, here's Marjorie. Good morning, Marjorie. Hello, Mrs. Ransom. Uncle Mort Leroy said you told me to come downstairs. That's true, my dear, I did. Well, here I am. What do you want? I want you to get outdoors. Get some fresh air. Enjoy yourself. Here it is, a nice day. Is that what you got me down here for? Well, I think it's bad for you to stay cooped up in your room all the time. Your uncle's right, Marjorie. It's not good to stay indoors all the time. You're looking pale. Yes. Look at Mrs. Ransom. Look at the color in her cheeks. Why don't you be like her? Uncle Mort, you won't let me use rouge, and you know it. What? <laughs> <laughs> now, my dear, I'm afraid you misunderstood. I just don't want you locking yourself up in your room all the time. Will you kindly tell me what else there is to do in this town? Well, there uh, are lots of things. Name one. Well, uh, you could do a little gardening. I loathe and despise gardening. Oh, but gardening can be fun. Now, Leroy's been helping me here. To... Yes, and why do you think he's hiding upstairs right now? Why the little... <laughs> Here's Leroy now. Yeah, you see? Hey, everybody, listen to this. Dear Diary... Leroy! What is there worth living oh, for? Oh, there's not a boy in this town you can have an intelligent discussion with. Leroy! All the cute ones are in the army and all the intelligent ones are... Leroy, the... give me that! Leroy! <laughs> okay. Leroy, I hate you. What did I do? I think you're all hateful, all of you. Why, well, Marjorie, honey... Don't honey me! If there's one thing I can't stand, it's this thing! Now, what's the matter with her? She's going up to her room again, Unc. Yes, young man, and you're going up to yours. Oh. Then wait for me there. Gosh, Unc. I didn't know I was doing anything wrong. Just found the diary lying there, and I thought you'd like to hear it, so I just do okay, I'll go. <laughs> I'm sorry, Leela. Marjorie should have apologized. Oh, that's all right, Throckmorton. She's not a shelf, that's all. I'm worried about that girl. I don't understand her. All she does is stick around the house and mope and read. Too much reading isn't good for a girl at that age. It gives them ideas. Oh, I wouldn't worry. I wouldn't worry, Throckmorton. She'll forget it all. Gracious, I've forgotten every word I ever read. Uh, tell me, how old is Marjorie? Why, uh, let's see. She's, uh, 16, I guess. I don't know. Well, no wonder. No wonder what? Down where I come from, Throckmorton, girls start getting married when they're 14. Huh? And at 15, they worry about being old maids. I don't see what that's got to do with Marjorie. Did it ever occur to you that she might be human? Huh? Think it over, Throckmorton. <laughs> My little Marjorie. I wonder if Leela's right. Uh, Miss Kelsey, that Mr. Bullard from across the street's here. Mr. Bullard, what does he want? I don't know, sir. Shall I tell him you stepped out? No, send him in. I've been waiting for this. Hee <laughs> hee. This is the moment. Yes, sir. <laughs> if he thinks he's going to get his water turned on, he's got another guess. Oh, come right in, Mr. Bullard. Miss Gilsey says he's been waiting for you. I didn't tell her to say that. Well, well, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, uh, good day. Excuse me, I'll just get my vacuum clean out of your way here. I uh, just dropped over, Mr. Gildersleeve, to say that I'm afraid I owe you an apology. Oh, I don't know what for. For my behavior the other evening when you dropped by. I'm afraid perhaps I seemed a little abrupt. 
I didn't notice anything. Well, I didn't mean to. But uh, I'd had the devil's own time. You know, moving day, worst darn thing in the world. The wife usually takes care of those sort of things, but, uh, uh, say, this is a nice place you've got here. Well, it's not as large as some. Well, I like it. Comfortable. Shows real taste. None of this modern stuff. Oh, thanks. Uh, will you sit down? Well, I don't care if I do. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I uh, don't suppose you'd smoke a cigar. Don't care if I do. <laughs> yeah. oh, I like a man who smokes a cigar. I never trust a man who doesn't. Mr. Gildersleeve, I can see that you and I are going to get along together. I'll tell you after I've smoked the cigar. <laughs> so, as I say, we haven't got the place straightened out yet, but we're moving in today anyway, the whole kit and caboodle. Well, I hope you and your wife are going to like it here in Summerfield. Oh, we'll like it. I was brought up in this town, you know. Uh, the only one I'm concerned about is my oldest boy, Marshall. He's been going to prep school in the East, and now he's switching to public school, and... Well, it'll do him good, I say. May knock some notions out of his head. How old did you say he was? Seventeen. Very difficult age. You're telling me. I have a niece here who's sixteen. Well, well, that's fine. Maybe we can get them together one of these days, huh? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, mighty glad to meet you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Mighty glad to meet you, Mr. Bullard. <laughs> I expect we'll be seeing a lot of each other now that we're neighbors. Yes, indeedy. Now that you know the way, come often. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll tell you something. The first time I saw you across the street, I didn't think I was going to like you. I'm going to tell you something. I didn't think I was going to like you either. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it just goes to show. Oh, uh, by the way. Yes? You said you were with the water department, didn't you? Yeah, I, I'm in charge of it. Well, I feel like a fool. I forgot to do anything about getting my water turned on. And oh, now... don't give it a thought. The whole thing will be attended to. Uh, you sure you don't mind? Mr. Bullard, it'll be a distinct pleasure. I'll even waive the customary deposit. <laughs> ah, nice fellow. Yes, by George, as nice a fellow as you'd want to meet. And with all that money. Mind if I dust around you, Mr. Gilsley? Oh, go right ahead, Bertie. I'll just sit here and enjoy my cigar. Yes, sir. Given to me by Mr. Bullard. Custom made. He buys them in lots of 500. He seems real nice, that Mr. Bullard. Nice of fellows you'd want to meet. Rich, too. <sighs> Tells me he has a son Marjorie's age. Is that a fact? I ain't seen him around. Well, the family's not arriving till this afternoon. <sighs> <laughs> Our little Marjorie's growing up, you know, Bertie. Well, it happens to all of them. Yes, I suppose she'll be getting married one of these days. <laughs> you think a man off to that bullet family, Mr. Gilfley? Yeah. Well, she could do worse. Well, I guess they got plenty of money if that's what you want. Oh, I wouldn't want anything myself, Bertie. Any kind of financial settlement or anything, that would be out. But I might go and visit them now and then after they were married. <laughs> I bet. Hi, <laughs> uh, George, they'd make a handsome couple, you know it. You ain't even laid eyes on the boy yet, Mr. Gilsey. Well, if he's anything like his father, what a wedding. Champagne, flowers by the carload, a three-piece orchestra, articles in all the newspapers. And there I'd be in my full-dress suit giving away the bride. And me in a new silk uniform giving away wedding cake. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. If you're packing lunches, remember that every lunch should provide at least one-third of the energy and other essential food elements your children at school and grown-ups at work need for good nutrition. It's important, too, that you pack foods that taste good. So here's a grand suggestion. Include in each lunchbox nourishing sandwiches of bread or rolls spread with delicious parquet margarine. Parquet tastes so good and is so high in food energy value, too, it's doubly sure to satisfy hungry appetites. And remember, Kraft fortifies every single pound of parquet with 9,000 units of vitamin A. So in meals you serve at home and in the lunches you prepare for school or work, 
Be sure to include Parquet, the nourishing spread that tastes so good. Buy Parquet, the delicious spread millions prefer to any other brand. Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Made by Kraft. Now let's rejoin the great Gildersleeve. He spent some happy hours dreaming of a marriage of convenience for his niece Marjorie, which would include a convenient old age for himself. Now it occurs to him to take steps to make his dream an actuality, so we find him arriving at Peavy's Drugstore to consult the Oracle. Well, where's Peavy? An early summer nap, I guess. Oh, Peavy. Peavy. <laughs> Sorry to disturb you, Peavy. Oh, you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, what... <laughs> what can I do for you this afternoon? Peavy, how do you think you're going to get anywhere in business if you spend your time asleep in the back room? You'll never get rich that way. Well, not. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I suppose you're going to say you weren't asleep. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. I was leaning back in the chair out there, and I may have dropped off just for a minute. Uh, what time is it? Three o'clock. That room must be stuffy. I went out there about 12.30. <laughs> well, sir, what can I do for you? Well, as a matter of fact, I wasn't going to buy anything, Peavy. But seeing I woke you up... Well, you don't have to buy anything, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'm much obliged to you. Well, I just wanted to talk to you. I, am. Um... I'm thinking of marrying my niece, Marjorie. Well, I hope you'll be very happy. What did you say? <laughs> Peavy, I'm think of, thinking of marrying her off to, to somebody else. Mm, I was going to say you're a little old for her. <laughs> now I think of it, she's a little young to get married, isn't she? Well, I don't know. Her mind seems to be full of nothing but nonsense about love. Maybe the only way to cure it is to let her get married. That makes you think that'll cure it. <laughs> Well, a married woman soon learns that life is a matter of bringing up children and running a household, not dreaming about romance. She does? Well, gosh, doesn't she? Mr. Gildersleeve, last week I caught Mrs. Peavy cutting a picture of Sonny Tufts out of a magazine. <laughs> you don't say. In fact, and I gave her quite a talking to. My gracious woman, I said, why don't you pick someone your own age, like Barry Fitzgerald, I said. And she said he was too old for her. Made me kind of shy about the whole thing up. Well, I'm tired of arguing with Marjorie. Let her argue with her husband. Have you uh, anyone in mind, or are you just looking around? Well, I understand Rumson Bullard has a boy about 17, my new neighbor. I thought you weren't speaking to him. Listen, Rumson Bullard is a fine fellow, and don't let anybody tell you different. I want to see the cigar he gave me this morning. No. Mm. Well, he's got this boy, Peavy. Now, he and Marjorie, they're both about the same age, and they live right across the street from each other. The only problem is how to get them together. Mr. Gildersleeve, I'd say all you have to do is just let nature take its course. Nature? That's no way. No, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Nature's a powerful force, Mr. Gildersleeve. Look at Niagara Falls. Drip, drip, drip for 3,000 years, but she made it. <laughs> I don't want Marjorie to wait 3,000 years, Peavy. Besides, if I just let nature take its course, how do I know that Marjorie won't marry some fellow that plays a saxophone and hasn't got a dime? You, you never know how a woman's mind is going to work. Mr. Gildersleeve, you said it. <laughs> well, what am I going to do, Peavy? Don't ask me. Ask a woman. But you've been through all this. I mean... Mr. Gildersleeve, I don't know anything about women. I just married one. <laughs> Anyway, what I'm trying to tell you, Leela, is that I think you're right. Marjorie ought to get married, and I've picked out the man. Oh, Throckmorton, how exciting. Who is he? Rumson Bullard's older boy. I was wrong about Bullard. Nice family. Well, how old is the boy? Seventeen. That's a little young, of course. Yeah, Marjorie's known boys her own age before, and they've never even tried to hold her hand. Really? George William Hungerford asked me to marry him on his 17th birthday. Gosh, I had to help him a little. Well... <laughs> I may have to help out Bullard's boy. Oh, you can't do it, silly. Marjorie's the only one that can help him. Well, how? How did you get George William Hungerford to pop the question? Don't you wish you knew, Throckmorton? <laughs> well, was George William the first one that asked you? Of course. 
course he was. Oh, no, wait a minute. He wasn't either. Mercy, I'd forgotten all about poor Custis Dupree. Yeah, uh, well, what happened to Custis? He was the first one. His voice cracked in the middle of it. <laughs> Look, Leela, what I want to know is how you brought these fellows to the point. Well, now, let me see. Custis was easy. I just dared him to kiss me. But George William was more difficult. He was simply mad about horseback riding. Well, what's that got to do with it? Made things very complicated. He used to take me out riding, but every time we'd be riding along nice and cozy, side by side, and he'd start to get serious, that horse of his would rear up and gallop off down the path. Well, then why didn't you make George Williams stay home and sit in the parlor? He was hopeless in the parlor. Tongue-tied? And handcuffed. But I... <laughs> I figured it out. One day we were out riding. I made my horse run away. I galloped away from George William, and as soon as I was out of sight, I got off and gave him a slap, and off he went for home. George William? No, the horse. When George William caught up with me, I told him I'd been thrown. Leela, you're a devil. I suppose you cried, huh? No, no, I was brave. I don't look my best when I cry. <laughs> anyway, he picked me up. He was terribly strong and just, just swung me up on the saddle. And then he got up behind me and we rode home. But what made him propose? Oh, my goodness, Throckmorton, he had his arms around me for 14 miles. By George. Let's go horseback riding sometime, Leela. What for? Well, I... You're right. <laughs> Why go horseback riding unless you're hopeless in the parlor? Come here, Leela. Throckmorton. Huh? What's the matter? I'm afraid you've forgotten what you came over for. It's Mr. Bullard's boy that needs the help, remember? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Although if he's anything like you, Marjorie will need it. Ah, <laughs> uh, Leela, I've always been a gentleman. Well, I suppose as Yankees go. <laughs> Gosh, I hope Bullard's boy don't need anything as complicated as a runaway horse to get him started. But if that's what he needs, by George, he'll have it. Supper smells good. Shoulder wrap, Mr. Gillsleeve. Mighty funny, all of a sudden, all the lambs got shoulders, none of them got legs. Well, the legs have gone to war, Bertie. Uh, where's Marjorie? She's out in the backyard with some boy. Some boy? Uh, what boy? I don't know who he is, Mr. Gillsleeve. They're just out there sitting in the swing talking. You can see him from the window here. Huh? Where? Let me see, Bertie. Well, I don't like his looks. I'll send him home, that's all. I'll... Gee, wait a minute. Maybe that's young Bullard. Is that who it is, Bertie? I don't know, Mr. Gilsley. Leroy might know. Why, George, the kid looks like Bullard. I wonder... Leroy! Leroy here? Yes, he's around somewhere. Leroy! Lee... You calling me, Unc? Yes. Who's that boy out there with Marjorie, you know? That's Marshall Bullard. He came over about half an hour ago. Well, well. Maybe nature's not so bad after all. Huh? Nothing, Leroy. <laughs> That's all, my boy. Okay. Gosh, I thought he wanted me to do something. Well, Bertie, that's the young man. Marshall. Marshall and Marjorie. Make a fine-looking couple, don't they? They might in a few years. Oh, sooner than that, Bertie. Sooner than that. All right, George, I think I'll just tiptoe out there and see how they're doing. Uh, you like music, Marshall? Yeah. I'm crazy about, about Brahms and Chopin. Do you like that kind of music? Oh, I like classical music, but not for a steady diet. Well, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. I'm not exclusively classical. Oh, don't get me wrong, Marjorie. I'm not knocking classical. Oh, no. I love the Basie record of One O'Clock Jump. All his records are great. I think so, too. I, uh, <laughs> saw him in New York once at Radio City. Did you? Gee, I've only heard his records. He looks just like his pictures. Do you like Artie Shaw? I like him pretty well. Do you? Yeah, pretty well. Do you like to read? Oh, I read all the time. Do you like poetry? Uh, 
pretty well. Oh, brother, they'll never get anywhere this way. <laughs> well, Marjorie, I, I didn't know you were out here. Oh, company. Hello, Uncle Mort. This is Marshall Bullard. This is my uncle, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, how do you do, Mr. Gildersleeve? Well, well, my boy. Sit down, sit down. I'm delighted to meet you. Glad to have you in the neighborhood. I guess Marjorie's glad, too. Aren't you, Marjorie? Aren't you, Marjorie? Sure, I guess so. Why don't you sit over there with Marjorie, my boy, and I'll sit on this side. I'm getting a little, uh, stout. Oh, you're not really, Uncle Mord. <laughs> nice girl. That's okay. <laughs> I'll stand up. Stand up? <laughs> you're not afraid of my niece, are you? Oh, Uncle Mort. Huh? Uh, your dad and I are going to be great friends, uh, Marshall, and we want you to feel at home over here. Thanks a lot, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah. Say, why don't you stay for supper tonight? Glad to have you. Oh, no, I don't think I'd better. Why not? Come on, coax him, Marjorie. Why should I? Marjorie. I think I'd better be going. Mr. Gildersleeve, it's probably my supper time, too. Well, come back afterwards. Oh, we can't tonight, Uncle Moore. Why not? I have to do my homework. Homework? Well, I'll tell you. How would you both like to go horseback riding tomorrow, huh? <laughs> do you like horseback riding, Marshall? Uh, I like it pretty well. Well, I've never been on a horse in my life, and you know it, Uncle Mort. Why, Marjorie. Gosh, neither have I. Well, you can learn together. We'll get two nice, gentle horses, and you can take a long ride in the country. I won't do it. Marjorie. You'd better go now, Marshal. Maybe I'll see you around. Huh? Oh, sure. Well, good night. Wait a minute. Uh, good night, Mr. Gildersleeve. There he goes. Marjorie, look what you've done. What I've done? You're the stupidest uncle a girl ever had. And you're fat, too. Oh. <laughs> you go in the house. I've done anything, I'm sorry. It was all my fault. I guess I just haven't any tact, that's all. I guess I'm just a blundering idiot. I guess I'm just a fat old fool. But you don't have to sit there and agree with me. We were getting along so nicely. Now he'll never come back again. Don't you worry. I'll fix it all up for you. Oh, no. Well, you cheer up right now, young lady, or I will. Oh, no, please. I'll be all right. I'm fine now. I feel wonderful. Promise you won't say anything to Marshall. <laughs> all right. All right, George, don't tell me I don't know how to handle kids. Good night, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Music on this program was directed by Claude Sweet. And this is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company, makers of sake, margarine, and a complete line of famous quality food products. Kraft invites you to listen again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. In these days of food shortages, certainly no one's wasting important leftovers. But do you know the trick of making leftovers not seem like leftovers at all? It's easy with Pabstet, the delicious cheddar cheese food. First, make a luscious golden cheese sauce with Pabstet and a little milk. Then pour this tempting Pabstet cheese sauce on leftovers of meat, fish, vegetables, or rice, fixed any way you like. Presto, Pabstet has helped create a brand new main dish, rich in mellow cheddar cheese flavor. You can serve nourishing Pabstet many other ways, too. Toasted in sandwiches, melted with macaroni, or sliced to serve with fruits and pie for dessert. You can buy Pabstet in two delicious varieties. Golden Pabstet in the yellow package and Pimento Pabstet in the red package. Treat your family to both kinds. Ask for Pabstet, the delicious cheddar cheese food. This is the National Broadcasting Company.